Zambia is a beacon of hope <coughs> on the continent of Africa. Yeah. And the atmosphere remains relatively peaceful right. across all the regions. Uh, we are hopeful from the Democracy and Motherland Defenders Coalition that Zambia will continue to live by its standard mm. of being a torchbearer on the entire African continent. Mm. And here I want to be very clear. You want to be aware that Zambia has never seen any civil war. You want to be aware that Zambia has had democratic elections. You want to be aware that we have religiously held elections. Mm. <coughs> We've also had peaceful transitions of power mm. in this country. There has never been any challenge in terms of our democracy. And so we are very hopeful that the situation will continue being as, peace, as peaceful as it is. Mm. Uh, IP Nidai, before I proceed, my husband to indicate yes. that there are sporadic incidences or political violence mm. here and there. Uh, uh, we want to condemn those in the very strongest possible terms. Right. In particular, we have been saddened by the incident that happened in Namala, mm. uh, where individuals who were campaigning yeah. were stoned and so forth and so on. From the Young African Leaders Initiative and from the Democracy and Motherland Defenders Coalition, we condemn that barbaric behavior in the very strongest possible terms. Yesterday, we had a bad incident on Great North Road, where the vehicle of one of the candidates in this election was hammered, and the driver ambushed, harassed, intimidated. These incidences are so many. They are happening across the country. Uh, and, and, and it is our hope and prayer that the police are going to move in very quickly and ensure that all perpetrators of political violence are dealt with effectively so that they are able to meet the wrath of the law. So the atmosphere is relatively peaceful, but there are pockets of violence here and there which we believe that the police should be able to move in and do the correct thing and ensure that those that are perpetrating this violence are brought to book. There are some other people out there, more especially those in the political space, have argued when you say our polit political atmosphere or political environment is uh, somehow favorable. Others feel that Zambia really, is, we need to restart again. You know, we, 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 we are in a country where there is too much of uh, dictatorial tendencies, according to the allegations that are being you know, um, issued by some, some, some leaders in the opposition. You know, you've heard them. Others are coming from your sector, the CSO sector as well. How do you uh, react to such kind of sentiments coming from certain individuals that feel that maybe Zambia is somehow on fire? So first of all, the members have got a very good saying. Mm. The saying umwa no shenda atasha wajino kuipika. Right. Uh, this saying can be attributed to those who may not have traveled and have not been able to see what happens in other countries. I say proudly mm -hmm. as a Zambian citizen that we have a very impeccable record. I say proudly that our democracy is an envy not only of the continent but of the entire globe. Mm. I say it proudly because I have been able to see elections in different countries on the African continent. Yeah. And we have been able to see when people talk about the space in Zambia is shrinking, mm. those are jokes. Our democracy is thriving. Today as we are speaking, I'm on this platform. So many citizens out there are on various platforms. Today as I speak to you, IP, we have more than 50 television stations where people can freely engage and debate and participate in Zambia's democracy. 
today as I sit with you here, there are over 120 radio stations dotted across the country. Today as I speak with you, our people in very far-flung areas are able to even see the phone and communicate effectively. Remember, just a few years ago, it was impossible to communicate on the phone when you go in very far-flung areas. Today, there is no any part of Zambia where you can go and you are failing to communicate. My grandmother in the village proudly picks up her phone and talks to me on a daily basis. She's able to participate and see what is happening across the country. If you look at our democracy, I think that we have done very, very well. Those that have got this habit of painting this country black must be able to understand that ultimately the people of Zambia have the ultimate decision to make. President Edgar Chagwa Lungu did not become president all by himself. No. He became president because that mandate was given to him by the people of the Republic of Zambia. So there could be citizens out there who would have tried to become president, and the Zambian people have rejected them. And unfortunately, they have taken to international media. They have gone so many places to try and paint the country black. But the reality on the ground is that our people continue to enjoy freedom of expression. Our people enjoy adequate civic space. Our people are effectively able to participate without coercion, without intimidation. Zambia, as I've indicated, is a beacon on the African continent. It's an envy of most African countries. And this record, which is impeccable, we must be able to guard jealously as a country. Having talked about uh, the posit positives that you've mentioned, what areas are we supposed to improve as a country in terms of where we have not done well? in the last 57 years of uh, independence, or maybe in the last 10 years of uh, the Patriotic Front being in power? Which areas would you say we need to do much better? Uh, first of all, in terms of our democracy, mm. we have to understand that this competition for political power mm. must not be construed to be a matter of life and death. Mm. This should not be about survival of the fittest. This is supposed to be a competition for public service. That's what it's supposed to be about. And as I've indicated, I speak to so many young people on a daily basis, and I talk to them that you must be able to compete on the basis of ideas, that you must be able to compete on the basis of ideology, on the basis of policies. Mm. In essence, democracy is an intellectual discourse, an intellectual debate about ideas. It is not about stone throwing. But also, most importantly, it does not mean that you have to auction your country to the highest bidder in the hope for getting political power. It doesn't mean that. It means that we must be able to compete and and we must be able to allow Zambians to effectively participate. So as a country, in terms of what is the improvement that we must be able to do, we must be able to continue to mature our democracy. There's a lot more that we can do. We must be able to improve on, on the legal frameworks. In particular, I think there has been talk about the issue of the public order act, those that are going to tell you the shrinking space and so forth and so on. Those are issues that we must be able to work on as a country and ensuring that the space is constantly being increased. Mm. Already, there's a lot that is being, is being done, but we must be able to thrive to do more as a country. Just on the Public Order Act, I yes. think uh, it's, uh, it's an emotive issue, I think, that has been coming for a long time now. And uh, maybe some of us who were born about uh, maybe uh, 30 years ago, mm. you know, people may be wondering, to say, why has the... You know, our, our Zambian government taken so long to uh, maybe repeal this, uh, this uh, legal framework. W what is it that really we are, we are afraid that if we are to harmonize the Public Order Act, maybe it might injure other people? What could be the problem? 
I, I think this is a you question know, that must because be. 1955 for me is mm. a year where even you were not there as well. Mm. What could be the problem? We are look for God's sake. We chased away the colonial masters. These are the foreigners. Other people call they call them Wamuisa. Mm. You know. But again, on the other hand, again we are still using their legislative laws that they left to us. What is it? There so, are so many arguments. Others feel that maybe this public order act only favors those that are in power. And hence, when they get there, the public order act becomes very sweet on their side. So this question in particular, for mm. me, who has been an advocate for democracy in this country, and who has been an advocate for the repealing of the public order act, mm. I'll proudly sit here mm. and probably sit on your end and ask the opposition that question and say, why have you been afraid mm. that we are supposed to amend the Public Order Act? And the reason why I say this mm. is because this president, yeah. this president, President Edgar Chagwadong, has demonstrated effective political will to ensure that the democratic space is widened. Has demonstrated political will to ensure that pieces of legislation that have been cantankerous for a very long period of time are dealt with effectively. Successive governments before the PF government sure. did not want to entertain any talk of amending the Public Order Act. They never wanted to. The MMD had three different presidents. None of them was willing to touch the Public Order Act. I remember, in fact, President Michael Sata having said, you know, when I was in opposition, I thought that the Public Order Act was a bad piece of legislation. Now that I'm in government, this is a sweet piece of legislation. This president, President Edgar Chagwalung, opened the Public Order Act to debate. Opened it in public to say this is a document that you have been talking about for years. Let's work on it. And that's why I was saying I would prefer to be seated in your, in your place and ask the opposition, why did you frustrate the effort to amend the Public Order Act. We went to the National Dialogue Forum with a view to not only amend the Constitution of Zambia, but also repeal and amend the Public Order Act to make it more democratic, to increase the space for citizens to effectively participate in the governance of their country. That view went to Parliament. Parliament opened it up to the public. It went to Parliament for debate. Guess who stopped the Public Order Act? The Public Order Bill? Former Member of Parliament for Monza Central, Jack Mwimbo, Chairman for Legal for UPND, is the one who stopped the bill from being debated on the floor of the House. And we're left wondering, what is happening? These people have been crying about the Public Order Act for a very long time. And here is an opportunity. The former Minister of Home Affairs tabled the bill in Parliament in our own eyes. We're seated in the gallery waiting to see that the bill be debated. So, to cut the long story short, mm -hmm. this president has demonstrated political will. This president has demonstrated leadership and has been magnanimous in terms of opening the civic space. And all that it requires between 2021 and 2026 is that we must grow as a country. In particular, some of the political players must mature to a level where they make a difference between what is partisan in nature and what is of national interest. If, for instance, we reach at that level where we're able to make this distinction, 
then we are definitely going to go to a very, very high height in terms of our democracy in Zambia. Otherwise, key point is that there has been adequate political will to amend so many pieces of legislation for the greater good of the Zambian people. And what is sad at this uh, particular moment, uh, President Ntewewe, is that uh, this blame game has been going on for a long time now. Um, I don't believe really, or maybe the viewers that are watching us right now, others will still argue with you to say really, if government want that public order act to be, you know, um, harmonized or to be repealed, it's not about the opposition. They've got all the powers to ensure that maybe something can be done. Because really, for how long are we going to blame each other as a country? 57 years of independence, we are still talking about one and the same issue. And that again, in addition, it came alongside uh, the, um, the, the famous or infamous, depending on which side you belong to, uh, Bill 10 as well. And one of the justifications from the opposition uh, members of parliament and also some independence uh, members of parliament then were that some of the good proposals in coming up or redefining the constitution was some of the good things were mixed with the bad seats and therefore they had no option but just to cast, uh, discard everything that was there so that was their first of, all, first of all your question if i want to hear you correct mm is that you were saying that the government should simply have proceeded. Mm. Our form of legislation requires that there's always consensus. Right. You, there is no one single particular political party that can bulldoze a piece of legislation through parliament. Any bill must be subjected to adequate debate. Mm. It must be subjected to adequate consensus building. I've argued with a number of people and I've told them to say, look, when a bill goes into parliament, it goes through five different stages. There are three readings, first reading, second reading, and third reading. In between these readings, there is the parliamentary committees that have to be put in place. One, there's a select committee and the committee of the whole house. So makes it five different processes. Mm. And the essence for this is to ensure that a bill is properly refined, that there must be input from all stakeholders, that the people's representatives must be able to debate these issues. Mm. So when a bill is tabled in parliament, it doesn't necessarily mean that the government of the day can bulldoze its way anyhow. No, because there are requirements. You must be able to garner the numbers. And if those numbers are not fulfilled, then it means that this bill may not succeed. That is how the Public Order Bill of 2019 failed in Parliament. Mm. That is how the Constitution Amendment Bill failed in Parliament. But talking about the failure of the Constitution Amendment mm. Bill, I want to tell you that I'll say what I said when the bill failed that the people of Zambia are the ones who lost out. Recently, I've been in Northwestern province to see the vastness of Kasempa and to imagine that this is only one constituency makes my heart to bleed. Bill number 10 was a gateway to ensure that we have effective delimitation of constituencies. Today, as you and me are seated, we don't have that delimitation we, don't, we have the same number of constituencies that we had in 2016. Why? Because some people were playing partisan politics on a matter of national interest. The failure of Bill Number 10, IP, this was a bill that would have given our women an opportunity for effective representation. This was a bill that my fellow young leaders would have been very happy with because this time around would have had special seats for young people to go in parliament. And that's why I want you to come Bill in number and, uh, 10. Try to be, uh, maybe try to simplify. Yes. I think that's one of the arguments that have been coming yes. forth when you talk about if Bill number 10 went through, it was going to at least maybe 
uh, give that privilege to the young people yes. to sit in parliament or maybe to be given a certain area to compete amongst themselves. Yes. And also the differently abled yes. persons as well. Exactly. As well as you the know, women. As well as the women. Yes. You know, but other people have come here again the way where you are seated right now. Yes. Have argued saying what these people are talking about is a fallacy. What these people are talking about is a far-fetched dream because the, the UN Charter, all those things are already enshrined in it. You know, it calls for a 50-50 uh, representation you see, uh, in governance you structures. See, you see, and IP. others again, they're saying the president has got powers to nominate eight members of, you, you uh, I mean, uh, min, uh, ministers, what, uh, members of parliament rather. Whatever. But why has he failed to demonstrate by giving that to the young people? So, first of so all. How would you substantiate? So, let, let, me, let me first of all begin by indicating that whatever charter that Zambia has subscribed to mm. cannot be implemented in Zambia unless it's domesticated. Right. <clears throat> so without domestication, it simply remains a charter and may not be implemented. The second thing that is very important for those proponents, those who argue, those critics, mm. is that what Zambians we are looking for we are not crumbs from the table. I hope you hear what I'm saying. We're not crumbs from the table. They wanted a legal framework that was clear. Give women this number of seats. Give the youth this number of seats. And give persons with disabilities this number of seats. That argument they have given of the president. The president is only allowed by the constitution to nominate only eight members of parliament. Only eight, for heaven's sake. And then now, of eight, now, now, why can't he demonstrate? Now, now wait, wait a minute. Even, mm. if, even if the president was to appoint all the eight to be women, is that what we are looking for? No. What we are looking for is effective representation, which is properly legislated. And, 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 and if you look at our numbers, eight is a very small number that you cannot cater for everyone within that eight. It's not possible. But also, you know, these very people that talk against the president and says, why hasn't he demonstrated? This is their president, once again, who for the first time in the history of Zambia appointed the first vice president woman in this country. Now remember, he appointed her the right name mate at a time when the vice president was given more power. There were five different other presidents before President Edgar Lung. None of them appointed a vice president who was a woman. None of them. Even when the position of vice president was ceremonial, none of them appointed a woman. But this president has been able to do that. This president has demonstrated political will. No wonder you are hearing the students' movement in this country is excited about this president. The youth movement in this country is excited because he has demonstrated that he is not afraid he has demonstrated that he is not intimidated. He has demonstrated that he is ready to work with the women in this country. He has demonstrated he is able to work with young people in this country. He has demonstrated he is able to work with various sectors of the people in this country. That is what this president has demonstrated. Right now as we are speaking, once uh, her owner, the vice president, uh, Inonge Mutukawina, decided to step aside, he went ahead again to appoint Professor Nkandulu to be his running mate. That is a demonstration of political will that this president means well for the women of this country, for the youth of this country, and for people with disabilities. Remember, and these are some of the things that we don't pay so much attention to. He was appointed ambassador for women and girls at the United Nations. Why? Because of his desire to uplift the living standards of women in this country. 
those of us who have traversed the country can be able to tell you that the women in this country feel passionate about this president. Why? Because he has demonstrated humility. He has demonstrated an ability to work with various sectors of our society. The political will that he has, he has, he has demonstrated is unmatched, is impeccable. And from the early point of view, we are proud of the kind of work that he has been able to do in this country. This is a president, uh, according to your words, who has performed you know, um, very well so far. Not so? He has performed extremely, exceedingly Fantastic. well. Fantastic. Yes. And uh, you are talking about a president who has been accused of being an oppressor to other opposition political party leaders. You are talking about a president who has been accused of being a dictator, according to the the, 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 uh, the opposition, uh, some opposition uh, leaders, this is a person again who has been accused of having failed to grow the economy of this country. <laughs> All these submissions coming from some citizens of this country as well as those in the opposition, and here you are as your president coming from the CSOs uh, saying, according to his performance, you feel that he's done much better or far much better where do you get this uh where do you, do you draw your facts look which are contrary to other look, people look look <clears throat> we're a leadership institute hmm. that's what we are and i'm not here to sugarcoat hmm. i'm here to tell it as it is we have been observing and been able to see president edgar lungu since he became president of this country i don't know what people call a dictator if, if, if President Edgar Lungu is a dictator, then one wonders what a democratic president must be like. Because here I am, I'm seated on this platform. You have hosted people with contrary views here. People are very huge critics of the president. At no any particular time has anyone stopped you to say, you don't do this. No. There have been people today, as we are speaking, who move about, go on various radio programs. Opposition leaders are able to speak very harsh words against the president. Mm. At no any particular time have you heard that this president has even uttered a single word to respond to the insults that have been given to him by various citizens. Where people who have abused social media to the extent of insulting the president in broad daylight. We have heard stories about what used to happen in the one-party dictatorial uh, system, how people would go missing. This has never been the case in our democracy, not at all. So I, I, your question is broad. When, when you talk about, no, the economy, he has, he has shrunk. The, how has he shrunk the economy? In fact, what he has done is to ensure that the economy remains afloat under very, very difficult circumstances. In the past five years, IP, we have had droughts. Number one, we have had floods. Number two, we have had COVID-19, which has paralyzed the entire globe. But Zambia's economy has continued to remain afloat, has remained resilient. He has not been sugarcoating, he has not been telling us quick fixes and so forth and so on. He has been very systematic in ensuring that the economy remains afloat. Today you and me are proud as we are seated here. Zambia has produced 3.6 million metric tons of maize. Why has that happened? It has happened because of effective, of effective policies. Today, the Zambian farmer is able to even export the maize. Why? Because of effective policies. As we are speaking, this is June, June 8. What has started happening as we are speaking right now is that fertilizer is being distributed across the whole country. 
Have you heard the farmers complain to say, no, they supplied maize to FRA and FRA has not paid them? Have you heard that story? Remember that story used to be in the news all the time. Three years, three seasons, farming seasons in a row. Our farmers are getting their, their monies on time. And we are certain, as the FRA has announced the price of, of buying maize, that even this time around, farmers are going to get their monies on time. So, which economy has shrunk? This economy is resilient. This economy has been able to absorb so much shocks. We are told at the beginning of this year that the economy would shrink, shrink by negative 4%. Why well, are we not told that? Today the World Bank has revised its figures about Zambia. Why? The economy has been resilient. Would you sit here, President Ntawewe, and uh, confirm to the people of Zambia as you face into that camera? Mm. And reaffirm your ways that um, the economy of this country is very much stable? I'm indicating that it has been resilient. Right. It has been resilient. If this economy was not resilient, it would have completely shrunk by now. Right. Remember, we were being told, no, you have wiped out your, your foreign reserves. Mm. You don't have any foreign reserves. Mm. What has started happening is that the Bank of Zambia is now building reserves. Just uh, about a week ago, the bank governor informed the country that we are now at 1.4 billion US dollars, which is almost four months of import cover. And somebody says we have wiped out the economy. No, the economy has been resilient. Yes, we have had shocks. Yes, uh, the prices of goods have, go have, have been high. Mm. What is the reason? I have indicated we have had very catastrophic, calamitous events. We have had a drought, we have had, we have had floods, we have had COVID-19. Zambia is land-linked. These goods are coming from outside the country. And it is not only Zambia which is experiencing the rise in the cost of living. Just last week, Joe Biden, the President of the United States, failed to answer a question on the cost of living in the United States. If you look at the cost of goods just here in South Africa and compare them with the cost of goods here in Zambia, you are going to discover that indeed the cost of living has become high. But by comparative terms, we are still doing better. If, for instance, you didn't have a government that was forward-looking, how much would you be buying a liter of petrol today? How much would you be buying a liter of diesel? This government, zero-rated petrol, zero-rated diesel. Why? To ensure that the consumer out there, the citizen, is able to benefit. If you look at the price of, of fuel in Zambia and compare in the sub-region, you're going to realize that we are much, much better. So, a lot can still be done. But the reality is that the economy has been resilient. I want to draw your attention to the three arms of government. Yes. You know, basing uh, this question on the submissions from, of course, uh, um, leaders of the opposition. Mm. Let, let's, let's start with the judiciary in terms of uh, its performance maybe in the last uh, 10 years under the periodic front in government. How would you rate the judiciary in terms of the way it has performed before we come to the legislator as well as the executive? One of the key things that you must be able to look at is to look at the performance of the judiciary mm. in terms of the cases that they've been able to handle. Yeah. How have they handled cases? Mm. In Zambia, when you go to court, it doesn't matter what your name is. Right. It doesn't matter what political party you belong to. Mm. It doesn't matter what your tribe is. It is about the issue at hand. That is why people have been prosecuted in this country, regardless of their status in society. That is the reason why the government has gone to court and some of the cases have been lost. 
Why? Because the judiciary is an umpire and must be able to mete out justice equally, equitably, and fairly to all citizens. There are others that are going to tell you, Mr. President, that uh, the judiciary itself needs uh, a total overhaul in terms of uh, its operations. The reason being that there are certain cases whereby a case may be supposed to take them maybe even a, a month, if anything, maybe even a, uh, maybe six months. It <laughs> takes five years just like that. You see, you Others see. again have gone further to say this time around it's about who, who, whom you know. You know, if you are not connected to the powers that be, and then it means your case will you know, will land you in trouble, will land you in, in jail. As I have indicated. Or in prison. As I have indicated. While as for those that are connected to the powers that be, their cases, they easily get disposed of. First of all, why would anyone go to court hmm. if, for instance, you feel that these courts are not impartial? If you, look at, the, if, you look at, if you look at the number of cases that are before our courts of law, there are hmm. so many of them. And people who sometimes have disparaged our judges and talked ill about our judges have woken up the other day and said they have got confidence in our judiciary. And they go to court because they believe that justice is being meted out. Mm. But most importantly, remember when you talk about the justice system, mm. it's not only going to be just a good justice system when it passes judgments that are favorable to you. You must be able to understand that there will be two sides of the argument in the court of law. But ultimately, the umpire's decision must be accepted. Hmm. Can you imagine that 11 players against 11 on a football pitch are playing football and they don't want to listen to the umpire in between, the referee? That will be chaotic. That will be anarchy. So... Insofar as we are concerned, we believe in the integrity and sanctity of the judiciary. Right. We believe that the judiciary has performed very well, given the fact that our constitution has guaranteed the independence of the judiciary. Mm. Effectively guaranteed. Today in Zambia, not even the president of the Republic of Zambia can suspend a judge on the bench. Why that is like that is because we believe in the integrity, sanctity, and independence of the judiciary. And, and that's the reason why from the Young African Leaders Initiative point of view, we have been a proponent that the judiciary must be respected. You may go to court and the decision may not be for you at that particular time. But you still must respect the judiciary. You may go to court and the decision may be favorable to you at that particular time. You must be able to respect the judiciary. Because in the first place, you went to court believing that they are able to make out proper justice. So insofar as we are concerned, we have been able to look at the number of cases that have gone in. We have been able to look at the fact that the, our justice system is blind to who you are. Yes, there have been individuals that have been acquitted. But what do you do if they are innocent? They must be acquitted. You cannot just sit back and say, no, we want this person convicted, we want that person convicted. It doesn't work like that. The justice system must be effectively tested. And people the executive must... as well. It's another you know, department that uh, many have proposed the need to also maybe try to, to clean up. The, the, you know, the, the argument we've today... We've got people that execute these uh, procedures or these uh, 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 laws... But uh, they've been accused to say these are political, uh, politically minded individuals. Uh, I we talk about the police as well. Almost every day they are receiving attacks coming from, um, you know, leaders in the opposition. The, the they are saying the police now has become compromised. The beauty. The police are being used by those that are in power. The beauty. Others have even gone further to threaten <laughs> IG Kanganja if they form government that he needs to go. You know, all those things like that. You see, first Beside of that, again, we've got people that get arrested instead of spending maybe 48 hours as the law prescribed. They go maybe even for 14 days, 
more than that the beauty as an independent in, member the beauty in a democracy leaders. the beauty in a democracy is that everybody is allowed to air their views right and these institutions must be subject to public scrutiny right they cannot run away from public scrutiny I'm not going to stand here and defend the police. That is mm. not my responsibility. The police have. I, I'm fully aware. The police that, have. You are not in the charge police, of the police. The police have a responsibility. No, you are in charge of the judiciary. Yes. But we ask you because you are an independent citizen of this country exactly. and also coming from the CSO. Absolutely. So we, we just and want so to get your my view, analysis regarding so my these view issues is very in terms simple. of governance. My view is very yeah. simple: is that the police will constantly be scrutinised in terms of how they are performing. If, for instance, Inspector General Kanganja is not doing the correct thing, people are going to stand up and say, Inspector General, mm. we need more action. Mm. And from the early point of view, we have never shied away on calling on the Inspector exactly. General and of police the to, to be able to say, dismissal, say, can you, you do the, the correct past, thing yes. and ensure that yeah. uh, those, that, happy with those it, right? that are perpetrated politically... The, the, the police service. Now, understand this. Mm. The fact that you are demanding for more action means that you are putting this public institution on its tentacles. Right. Means you are simply saying more can be done. The President of the Republic of Zambia has also been on record mm -hmm. demanding more action from the police. I began by discussing the issue of political violence. Sure. What is happening right now in Damala is unacceptable. That's ethnic cleansing. It must be dealt with, and every perpetrator of that violence must be brought to book. And the story of Namala, remember it has been in the news since 2016, where people's houses were being burnt for having different political views, for having divergent views. And our demand has been very simple, can the police do the correct thing? You said you are one of those institutions that demanded for Inspector General to do the correct thing, in particular on the Hatembos, who up to now have gone missing. And we continue to demand that the Inspector General of Police must do more and ensure that the lives of these two individuals is brought out. We do not believe that simply because you have litigated a case against an opposition leader, that should make you go into, in, into abduction or kidnapping or that you must be forcibly imprisoned. That's unacceptable. So the demand for the police to do more will always be there. In terms of the executive I have indicated, the executive led by President Edgar Chagwalungu has performed exceedingly well. IPU and me sat and, and one time I complained about the fact that you go to a country such as Zimbabwe, it has so many universities. In 2011, Zambia only had three public universities. Only three public universities. As I sit down with you, under the nine years of President Edgar Chagwalungu's leadership, under the PF government, we are now able to see nine public universities fully operational. That's an impeccable record. That's the way we must be able to go. If you talk about the performance of the executive, you talk about health delivery, service delivery to our people. I've been in the far-flung areas, in the very remote areas, and you find a hospital, a mini hospital, beautiful mini hospital, built by the government of the Republic of Zambia. Almost each and every district today, as I'm speaking to you, uh, IP, has a district hospital. That's effective service delivery to our people. Today, when you are moving on the road, pay attention. Not almost every, after five kilometers, you are going to be able to see that there is a primary school, there is a learning institution which has been put in place by government. That's a way this country must be able to go. That's a direction we must be able to go. When I tell you I'm going to be in your studios in five minutes, IP, do you know the reason why? It's because we have beautiful roads, which are lit, by the way. Mm. Look at the way this place was here, movie TV. It used to be dark. People used to be beaten here, just here at Unza. There used to be no road here whatsoever. Today, you have got roads everywhere in this country. When you look at the face of Lusaka, it has completely changed. 
There are flyover bridges everywhere. There are traffic lights everywhere. There are street lights everywhere. In the compound, in Matero, there are lights everywhere. What is very interesting is that even rural electrification has gone very far that to the extent that even in rural areas, people now have lights. That's the extent of the work that the executive has been able to do. And, mm -hmm. and from the Young African Leaders Initiative point of view, it's very important, and I'll say this for purposes of this program, mm -hmm. that consistency in leadership is very important. One of the biggest challenges that Zambia has had since 2008 is that we have not had a very consistent leadership. Remember President Manawasa died in office in 2008. He did not finish his 10 years in office. Then came President Rupia Banda. President Rupia Banda was only in office for only three years. Then came President Michael Sata. President Michael Sata was also in office for only three years. If you are able to look at the trajectory on the African continent and see the countries that are doing well, there have been understable regimes. You don't change governments like you're changing a shit. No. Because the moment you're changing governments like you're changing a shit, you bring about instability in terms of policies, in terms of ideology, in terms of service delivery framework. That's what actually happens. Because if, for instance, the unthinkable happened, and you moved PF out of office today, you're going to bring another political party, which is going to bring its own direction. And, and that, that will cause, no, that, that, that will cause, out there. that will cause, most of the competitors are saying, I think the PF have failed beyond definition. The, the point is that you know, the PF, so they have to vote the to PF have performed exceedingly well. And as I've indicated, it would be naive, politically naive, to remove this government out of office. Because if you do that, you're going to bring about policy inconsistencies, instability. Already, you, look, Zambia is destined for great things. Today, as we are speaking, copper is still fetching over 10,000 US dollars on the market. What this government has been doing is that it has taken KCM, a big conglomerate, mining giant. This belongs to the Zambian people. This government has gone further to take Mopani. These others who are outside government, who want to come in government, have told Zambians that Zambians cannot manage to run their mines. Why, why, why can't you give them maybe, would, why would, wouldn't you propose that maybe Zambians, they give them chance as well to come and preside the affairs of this country. Reason being that others, of course, have proposed, for example, HH, it comes out very strongly, very promising, uh, telling the people of Zambia to say... That he is going to sell national assets. Is, that he is going to sell that, national assets. From that, I think it's one, very important that our people understand. There is one understand. profound statement yes. that he, the man has made, and I think Zambians should somehow appreciate that, including you, if mm. you're a, Zamb a well-meaning Zambian, in which he said, if I'm sworn in into office, within five hours, the economy or the quarter is going to appreciate. That is a joke of is the that air. That is a joke of the air. It's a joke of the air. And, and one would just advise him to say, if you don't have anything to tell to the electorate, better keep quiet. Because you don't have to lie to Zambians like their children. What economics has it done which says that the dollar will just change just like that? The appreciation of the dollar must move directly in concurrent with productivity. Our challenge right now is that we are importing more than we are exporting. That is our challenge. As well as and, 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 borrowing. As and, well. and you are not no, going to wake up. We, 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 we can discuss so. borrowing. We can discuss mm. borrowing. But what I'm discussing here and is, because is of the, the issue the, of... The roads that you've talked there, about. There are no fly quick... Over bridges. There, there, and that's a campaign message that the, the, op the opponents have, you know, so have carried out. First of all, I was just explaining something here yeah. which is important here. Please go ahead. That for you to deal with an exchange rate, it doesn't come down like magic 
abracadabra. No. It's work. As a country, you must be able to work at it. And how do you work at it? You improve productivity. One of the ways of improving productivity is the issue that I talked about, producing more maize. So that you're able to export. Once you export, you bring in foreign exchange. Produce more copper. Once you are able to export the copper, bring in foreign exchange. That is the way you're going to deal with the, the kwacha. You, it cannot work like magic, like what HH is suggesting. Those are jokes. And, and no any serious economist or anyone who has done basic economics can take him serious because that is blatant lies in broad daylight. I want to when, when you are discussing the issue of, yeah. of, of debt, yeah. look, today as we are speaking, remember there was a moment we were crying about load shedding. Mm. Do we have load shedding anymore? It has gone. How has it happened? We have invested in solar electricity. Don't you think uh, this is just a temporal, you know? Temporal no, measure, it is not temporal you know, because in which may be, uh, according to, of course, uh, look, you know, submissions out there. The, the, after the elections, we might get back look, to, look, to, to, to the West. Look, you know, remember in 2015, when we, we had, had the same load when shedding, we had load right shedding. The 2016 elections. When after the elections, what happened? Again, the load shedding came back. Don't you think it's just one of the Look, cosmetic solutions? First of all, solution? there's nothing cosmetic. Hmm. For us to have electricity, we need about 2,800 megawatts of electricity hmm. on a daily basis. That's what we need as a country. This is the power that is being generated but what in happened? our various stations. What happens so, really when we are promised to say maybe in such a year, yes. load shedding will be a thing of the past? And this is what has happened. When that time comes again, we begin to endure the West. No, what but, no, but the point is, yeah. the point is, government has been working at improving power generation as well as distribution. Right. Today, as we are speaking, I was just telling you mm. that you have improved your electricity generation. In the past, there was nothing like solar. Mm. Today, Zambia is producing adequate solar. In the past, there was nothing like thermal energy. Today, Zambia is producing electricity through thermal energy. Right. In the past, you had the Kariba Dam, which was built in the 60s, without any refurbishment. This government has been able to invest in Kariba so that it's refurbished. As we are speaking right now, Kafua Gorge Lower, to produce 750 megawatts, is now complete. So, you, you don't do quick fixes. You don't just wake up and fix. How are you going to fix? It requires that you work at it. It requires that you must have programs. What are the programs you are going to implement? And, and for instance, that same HH we are talking about, more often than not when you call him, say, what are you going to implement? The PF has done this. What are you going to implement? The PF has done that. No, what are you going to implement? He has literally failed to explain. The only economic policy that HH has taught Zambians is that Zambians cannot run their own minds. Mm. In essence, what HH wants to do is that he wants to sell KCM and Mopani and give it, well, give it to the foreign friends. What evidence do you have really, look, Mr. Ntewewe? What H evidence? That look, look. Yeah. On a platform... Mm. HH openly stated mm. that I am going to sell KCM to Anglo-American Corporation. Which platform was that? Chingola, at a rally. Right. And it's on record. Nobody has lied to him about that. lied about that. It was his own mouth. He opened it. That he's going to bring Anglo-American Corporation. And the people on the copper belt were surprised. He's going to bring Anglo-American Corporation, which ran away. This person has been everywhere indicating uh, proudly the first thing I'm going to do when I become president is to sell the presidential jet. EOHH, why do you want to sell the presidential jet? What has the presidential jet done to you? No, I'm going to sell it. The Zambia army even told him, look, the movement of the president is not about him. It's a business of national security. It is not President Ed Galung who went looking around for a jet. And no any other president can just wake up and say, oh, I'm selling this. How are you going to do it? Up to now, HH still insists 
But the first thing I'm going to do is to sell the presidential jet. We need to and, and, and given yeah. his history yeah. of selling assets, the Zambians cannot trust him with leadership. He which, was which, given. Which he was given. Would you, would, would you name that? Number Zambia one, Mosotunia so Hotel. Mosotunia Hotel in Livingstone. Mm. He sold it to himself. What evidence do you have? There is evidence. Where Even evidence? at the Zambia Privatization Agency, this evidence is in public domain. Why haven't you taken he was, to court? He was the chairman. So that maybe can Le be prosecuted. And he, was, he was the chairman for the negotiating team for the sale of Mosotunia Hotel. Mm. Two months later, he became the owner of that hotel. This hotel, there was an offer of 26 million US dollars. These are the issues for me that uh, uh, yes. he has explained, ably explained. He has to failed to explain. Zambia, I you know, no. And uh, for you, if you still feel aggrieved over those allegations, why didn't you take up that matter to go to the court of law or maybe to the police so that it can be prosecuted? From, the, from, the, from, the, young African leaders, you know, from the Young African Leaders Initiative point of view, yeah. we have been very pragmatic. We have called for the setting up of the Commission of Inquiry on Privatization. Besides that, why didn't you take up that matter? Or why didn't you for, take that for, matter to court? For, for us, the strategy is very simple. Mm. Let us deal with this matter through an inquiry. If it is dealt with through an if inquiry, it, come, if it, does, it definitely is going to come. If it and and, and come. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, mm. the good part about this whole thing is that some people felt that when we are demanding for a privatization inquiry, mm. we're doing it because we wanted to block mm. HH from contesting elections. That was not the idea. Who would want to stop somebody who has lost five times from contesting elections? Who would do that? This is a person who has been rejected by the Zambian people five times in a row. So, for us, it was an issue of, look, we demand for a commission of inquiry. The issue of privatization, the ghost of privatization, shall not lie until it's dealt with. I want to ask you this question. Yes. When you sleep or wake up in the morning yes. and you look at uh, the political activities that are unfolding from now going to August 12, and uh, there's so much you know, noise out there, mm. people calling for a wind of change, others uh, still want to, you know, to return power, the patriotic front, you as a member of uh, the CSO, do you think there's a wind of change come August 12? I am old enough to have seen the wind of change in 2011. Mm. And I was able to see how the streets of Lusaka were euphoric about the wind of change. I was able to see the streets of Copper Belt, Ndola, Chingola, they were euphoric. Today I walk around the streets of Lusaka, there is no any such wind of change. In fact, I'll tell you that from the early point of view, the way we are looking at this election, the PF will win it with a bigger landslide than 2016. That is the way we see Not it. Not even a rerun? There, there is no, uh, we don't see a possibility of a rerun. We don't see a possibility of a rerun. We see a complete landslide by the PF government. The works of the PF have done their work for them. That is the way we have been able to analyze it. The, the euphoria, the, the frenzy that is normally associated with the change of government is not there. Uh, and, what do and, you think and is lacking uh, from those in the opposition well, one that of, cannot necessitate well, one of the key things, of change? One of the key things what do you that think has lacked? is that there is no clear message from the opposition in terms of what they want to do. The Zambian people are asking, so what is it you're going to do different? Don't you think maybe the harsh economic challenges? The, the harsh economic challenges, as I have indicated, you see, Zambians are very intelligent. Mm. They've been able to see this issue. They know quite all right. They have been able to see COVID-19. Mm. They've been able to see droughts. They've been able to see floods. The, 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 the Zambians are well-traveled also. They've been able to hear what is happening in Job other countries. They've the been youths. able to see. They, they've also been able to see government empowerment programs mm. aimed at alleviating the challenges that the youth are facing. But what, what is clearly lacking in all this, right. in all this, what is lacking is a clear message from the opposition as to what they are going to do different. What is it you are going to do different from what this government is doing? Right. There's nothing. You know what President Michael Sata in 2011 hmm. swept the country with a clear message 
as to what he was going to do different. When you, when you look at the, our, our opposition, unfortunately, they don't seem to have a clear message as to what they want to achieve for this motherland. I want us to go, Mr. President, but I'll ask you uh, this question, yes. which will be possibly your second last question. Yes. Who is Andrew Ntewewe? There's been a lot of talks, a lot of allegations that Andrew Ntewewe is a mouthpiece for the Patriotic Front. Andrew Ntewewe is a member, is, is, is a member of the Patriotic Front. Andrew Ntewewe is a spokesperson for the government. Who is Andrew Ntewewe really? I am, a, into that I am a civil society leader, IP, right. and I am a very simple person. I am one kind of person who speaks my mind at every opportunity. Right. That is how I was brought up. I was brought up in a very straight family where I was told to say the truth to power. Those who have followed the Young African Leaders Initiative, when we have disagreed with government, we have been very categorical. We have never minced our words. Today, if we say that President Edgar Lungu has performed exceedingly well, it's because we have been witnesses to the development that President Edgar Lungu has been able to bring to our motherland. And from the way I was brought up, I have to say it as it is. I don't know how to sugarcoat so, yes, there have been a lot of talk. Sure. But one of the key things you must be able to understand is that we are in a democracy. And as I've indicated, democracy thrives on competing ideas. That all of us must be able to speak our voices. We must be able to contribute to the national discourse. And you can face the camera, of, Mr. President. In terms and, uh, of, yes. We are firm your words. Yes. And uh, I want you to, to, to swear mm. to the people of Zambia that mm. all you've said here, uh, you, did not, you did not lie, and you mean your words, you will not apologize in the future. I have never apologized for what I have stated. Mm. Our positions, from the early point of view, have been speaking to you. I am very clear. The Young African Leaders Initiative is very clear mm. about all the fundamental issues that we have been able to say. Uh, we don't do this out of hatred. Right. No. We do this out of the love for our motherland. And, and when I say that it would be politically naive to remove the PF government, I say it in honest, in earnest, believing that this is the right way in which things must be able to be done. I have never been one for malice. But at the same time, I'm very clear. I've told you about who I am in terms of my upbringing. I was brought up in a morally upright home. Right. And, 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 and for instance, if a political party belongs to a gay organization on the African continent, I cannot give them a chance. And the United Party for National Development is a member of the African Liberal Network, an openly gay network on the African continent. This is not a lie. This is the truth. What? So that is the point that we must be able to point it out. Mm. Secondly, I am afraid that if UPND was to be given a chance near state power, our national assets would be auctioned to the highest bidder. That the Zambian people must be careful about. Today, the commodities that are going on the international market, copper is now the oil, the new oil. We have to so, go. Zambians must guard jealously their national resources. UPND, unfortunately, is supported by foreigners who have targeted our national assets. And so it would be dangerous for Zambians we, to even give them We answer. have to go, Mr. President, and um, uh, allow me to appreciate you for coming once again. We hope to see you in the near future. I am very grateful for the invitation. Great. Thank you.
Yeah, viewers, we end our uh, discussion here. My guest has been Andrew Ntewewe, President of the Young African Leaders Initiative, Yali. Allow me to appreciate uh, my camera person, Christopher, for those wonderful pictures. We thank you so much. And also, Mavto Piri for as my producer, as well as um, Utunen Sunachagwa, who are streaming this program live. Not forgetting the Smart Eagles delegation is also in the studio to ensure that this program is uh, streamed live and also reaches uh, so many masses of the Zambian people. We count, continue counting down to the August 12, 2021. My name is uh, Innocent Piri. Allow me to say, may God bless Zambia, may God bless Mother Africa. Good night.